Right, we're live, so welcome. Welcome to our Women's Gathering, our Friday night Women's Gathering at Seed. I am absolutely thrilled to have my friend Norina Hertz as our special guest tonight. Um, we haven't seen each other for a long, long time, so it's very interesting in today's world. Here we are on Zoom instead of in real life giving each other a big hug. But it's so good to have you here, a virtual hug, yes. So anyway, fantastic to have you here. Um, so it's a very interesting conversation tonight we're going to have and we were just having a little chat about it. Hi Carol. Um, so we're going to be talking quite a lot about the book that you've just cut it out out now which we're going to have at the seed store by Monday but it's actually a sellout in reprint so that's brilliant. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about your other books because um, I don't know how long we, well, we've known each other probably since you were a child because I used to do PR for your parents fashion company in year dot um, but of course, you've had an amazing career as an academic and as an author and as a philosopher and a thinker, and I have nothing but admiration for all that you've done. And um, the earlier books that you've done, you always seem to bring a book out at an incredibly important seminal moment, um, which wasn't the plan when you started the books. Do you want to just talk a little bit about some of the early books that um, were huge yeah. global hits, weren't they? Hits. I can remember yeah. successes. <laughs> So I guess my first kind of um, big book was the book I wrote uh, around 20 years ago now um, called The Silent Takeover and the subtitle was Global Capitalism and the Death of Democracy and it really was kind of one of the first big books that kind of questioned the growing power of multinational corporations and what the implications of that would be and right that kind of really became one of the books that um, at the time was really championed by the anti-globalization movement, which was um, very big back then. And even though I'm not anti-globalization because I believe that actually global structures like the United Nations and the World Trade Organization even um, have important roles to play and World Health Organization and things like that. Um, the book you know, was very much of that moment by being kind of one of the first big critiques of neoliberal capitalism, the particularly harsh form of capitalism mm. that um, has really governed our lives since the 1980s. Well, yes, yeah. amazingly early to be writing a book like that. And I think a very important book that should be out now because I do, I'm do. i very anti-global capitalism and some of those organisations mentioned, but we won't go there. <laughs> it's available. I have, I have all your books in my library. I have all your books. Yes, if anybody wants to buy any of Norina's other books, they are still available and they are absolutely brilliant. And then you brought another one out. I'm just yeah. trying to remember which was... So the next one um, was kind of um, was all about uh, developing country debt, third world debt. Um, the debt crime, um, IOU, the debt threat, and that became really one of the books that was very seminal in the, do you remember the um, cancel the debt movement? I do. In 2000, so that was the book around um, which that campaign really kind of um, helped that campaign, which I'm really proud of being part of, um, because we had real actionable impact you with did. our idea. You did. You did. That was really great. And then my last book was a bit of a departure um, for me because Eyes Wide Open, because it was still political, but in a much more personal sense. And it was about how do we make, make smart decisions ourselves um, in an increasingly complex world? How do we know who to trust and what to trust? And um, no one, we don't trust it. anybody. <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess because I did, I did um, quite controversial at the time TED talk around that theme, which was really essentially saying we need to challenge experts, and because um, that was one of the themes of that book. Which, um, you know, because it is that thing about it is important to challenge all the ideas you're being presented, um, not just take anything at face value. So yeah. those were some of the. Um, themes in that book. And, and, yeah, and I, I think that's really relevant in the new book as well, because part of the lonely century is that we don't have that trust and belief in the big organisations or the media or whatever we hear and get told lots to do with social media. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, sorry, you, you, I didn't, I just thought that's something no, 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 that, was, that was good, that was, that was totally to the point. <laughs> um, 
And then, um, so those are, I guess, my three kind of big books before. My first, my very first book is a very academic book, which, um, which I'm sure nobody needs to know about. <laughs> but, um, but, but these are the books that yeah. you know, really kind of... Well, they made a huge difference. They really made a huge yeah. difference, those books, every one of them. But you also, also have quite a gap between your books, which I've noticed. Because uh, I suppose it's the gestating period, isn't it, really, of what's coming? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I need quite a lot of time to really think about ideas. And, uh, yeah, I'm not one of those get a book out every year type authors. I really like to you know, have big ideas, which take time, as you say, to just state. And then the process is quite grueling of writing them. So I always need a period where I forget how, I need to forget how grueling it is. Well, you're a true academic because there is so many references at the back of the book for anybody that wants to check. I mean, only an academic. I was thinking that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> when I've written my books, I do. It's like I thought that from my intuition, and I don't have the reference. Just anyway, but it's brilliant. So tell me how the Lonely Century started, because this obviously started way before COVID. There was no feeling at that point that we would really be locked up. It was looking much more at the world from a technology and all the rest of it. So how long ago did you start working on it? So I started uh, working on this book about four years ago and it was really my students actually who were the first aha moments in office hours and I was realizing that a lot of them were coming and confiding in me how lonely and isolated and disconnected they felt and that was a new phenomenon because I've been teaching for you know almost 20 years and uh, this was new they hadn't I hadn't had swathes of students coming to me and confiding in me in this way and the other thing I noticed was that when I set them group assignments, they many were really struggling with in-person, face-to-face interaction. In again, something which felt very new. And I, I mentioned it to an American president of a big American famous university who I was sitting next to at a dinner, and I told him what I was observing. And he said, we're having exactly the same issue here. In fact, here it's gone so bad that we're having to run how to read a face in real life classes for wow. our incoming students because they're spending so much time on their screens. They literally in a room don't know that if somebody's smiling, that means it's going well. And if somebody's frowning, that means it's going badly. And we're having to run these classes. So I thought, gosh, that's fascinating. So that was a kind of one aha moment, I thought. And at the same time, I was in my research, in my academic research, I was starting to look at the rise of right-wing populism, so Trump in America, um, Le Pen in France, Salvini in Italy, and I wanted to understand better what was underpinning this, and I started interviewing and hearing from right-wing populist voters across the globe. One of the things that was coming out of their stories was how lonely and um, disconnected they felt and how they were finding community in the far right and yes. right populism. And then if you think about Trump rallies, for example, you know, these are spectacles of community with people in their MAGA hats and and their beards uh, and their guns. Yeah. And they make exactly. it makes them feel they belong. Exactly. Mm. So that was another kind of realization. And then the third thing, these things were all happening at roughly the same time. The third observation was I had um, bought an Alexa, one of those voice activated um, machines that you can have in your house. Um, and I realized that I was getting quite attached <laughs> to this device. And it made me start getting interested in the role that robots and artificial intelligence can play in um Oh, was starting to play and I was seeing that there was a kind of growing demand for these products which again spoke made me think a growing demand why because increasing numbers of people are feeling lonely and it was those three very different things that together made me think I really want to dig into this contemporary manifestation of loneliness and better understand it and I think important just to convey is that the way I define loneliness is it's not just about feeling um, that you're lacking company or intimacy um, or the closeness of those, um, your friends and family. It's also about feeling disconnected 
um, from your fellow citizens, your governments, uh, your employer. It's about feeling not only uncared for by your friends or neighbours, but feeling uncared for by your state um, and the place you work for. So the way I define loneliness is it's political as well as personal, kind of right from the start. Absolutely, absolutely. So this started four years, or which would be three years before COVID. And the book starts off talking about the fact that having spent, I can't remember how many, 10,000 nights with your lovely husband all cuddled up together. 5,000. Five. <laughs> you, you, um, you got COVID yourself. You were just telling me you, you got it coming back from um, America from a business trip and uh, um, had to keep the space, even in your intimacy, physical space. And of course, at that point, I presume the book then took quite a turn as well because... Yeah. So I was just about to hand in the book um, in March and I'd finished this book, the book I've been working on for a few years and... It, I got COVID, COVID happened, the global pandemic happened, and I said to my publishers, I can't, I'm, you know, I need until, give me a few months, I need to see how this is unfolding, and I need to um, speak to it in the book, and then from March till June, I really surgically wove COVID throughout the book, and, um, and what was in a way quite shocking was how easy it was to do, because nothing that I'd written about no longer held true. It was just everything I'd been writing about and thinking about was now even more amplified, even more exaggerated, and even more urgent to address. Address. So, so, yeah, because we were already um, incredibly lonely before the pandemic struck. And in the United Kingdom, one in five people said before the pandemic that they felt lonely all or most of the time. And one in eight Brits said that they didn't have single friend that they could rely upon and this was before the pandemic and we know terrible. from we know from government data that came out just last week that the number of people who are feeling lonely now in the UK doubled over the past few months so of course you know, Ready with that is now so, uh, but before we go much deeper, I want to just say for those listening, we are going to be looking at solutions. We're not only <laughs> going to be looking, we're very much going to be looking at solutions um, yeah. uh, and not all the bad side. But there were some wonderful stories in the book before the COVID sort of transfer of loneliness and how some people dealt with it. Um, I, I was quite shocked, actually. I was quite shocked about the Japanese story of... Um, the, the elderly women who in society were not supported, uh, who were actually shoplifting and doing minor crimes so they would be put back in prison where they felt they had some kind of community. Did, I mean, that really gave me a huge shock. Um, yeah. do, do you want to sort of it, talk, elaborate yeah. on that? It's a very moving um, story that the fastest growing uh, group of people who are being jailed in Japan are pensioners. And this is because uh, researchers have established that the reason for this and why they are committing typically minor crimes like shoplifting is they're doing it intentionally to be jailed because they are so lonely. And half of those um, pensioners um, don't have a family or haven't spoken to their family. For over a year and their quotes are very moving you know i see jail as an oasis as a place where i can find the company and connection that i can't find elsewhere and you know it's a real um stain on our society that people are feeling so lonely that jail becomes the choice because that's the only it's place where incredible. they can feel connected it's incredible and then there were other stories which i found very moving. Uh, you you bought a friend for three hours in New York. Do you want to sort of talk a little bit about that? That was quite something. Yeah. No, you wouldn't be allowed to do that anymore. Or you'd have to be online, <laughs> wouldn't she? You have to buy them virtually. But what I discovered was um, that you can rent a friend. I mean, what bizarre concept? Yes, you can rent a friend. You can pay to rent a friend. And so when I was in New York I, for research purposes, I decided to try it out and I rented Brittany. Brittany is a 23 year old college graduate. I was a bit worried Lynn before I met with her thinking. Yeah, just, you know, looks worried. definitely a bit sus. <laughs> yeah, I was a bit worried but I met with her in a cafe downtown Manhattan and it, it was 
it wasn't obviously it wasn't like being with an old friend but it was it was like being with a new friend who you're clicking with and we chatted about our relationships we drank matcha tea together we went to a bookshop we went into a clothes shop urban outfitters we tried on sunglasses and hats we were kind of having a lot of fun and i actually forgot at various <laughs> points that i was paying her until at the end of our three hours we're in urban outfitters the clothes shop and she turns around to me and she says and that will be 120 dollars please <laughs> <laughs> but but what i what i found interesting was i said to her who typically rents you and she said my typical clients are men and women aged between 30 and 40 professionals often working in finance consulting technology who've moved to the city don't have time to make friends don't have support networks here and you know just want someone who they can go and have a coffee with or go to a movie with or go for a walk in the park with and um yeah so that's um it's a real reflection yes, of our times. It is, and a certain generation. And of course, that same generation are very much the Tinder generation where they were, again, before COVID and lockdown, meeting each other in the very flick your phone left or right way, which is hardly a, a sort of a start to something very deep. And yet, I do actually personally know quite a few people that married uh, or moved in with people they met on Tinder. So it obviously works for some. And, and, you know, it's, it's just, again, part of the part of what's going on in the, the modern world. The other thing that I thought was very, well, there's lots of very important points, but the, the, the phone scrolling thing that so many do. You even admitted on an interview I heard that you, you have been known to do it in the bedroom with your husband lying there. And so, I, I mean, I don't have a husband lying there, so but I don't check my phone in the bedroom either. <laughs> But I think that's scrolling. But I do see my, even my own family where the, the fathers particularly are scrolling on the phones and the kids are sitting there and then the kids start scrolling on theirs. And I mean, that's insane and must be affecting people. For sure. And, you know, I started my research and I was actually, I didn't have a position on whether smartphones and social media were making us more lonely. I wanted to dig into the research and really find out what the what what the reality of it was and i've come away from these years of working on this subject feeling absolutely sure that um social media and our smartphones have a lot to answer for here i'd go as far as to say that in my mind social media companies are the tobacco companies really of the 21st century i mean designed specifically to keep us addicted to them like every pixel every font every, every tick font, Yes. yes, everything designed to keep us on, to keep us constantly on our phones. And the trouble is that when we're on our phones, we are not present with those physically around us. And, you know, for sure, I've been guilty of that myself. And you almost don't hear other people. That's what I find quite scary is, you know, my husband will say, oh, I was saying something. And it's, you tune out because you're just so, your focus is so on these phones. And there was research done where the, um, looked where they asked couples how connected and empathetic they felt towards each other and then they compared that they asked the same question when they had a phone in between them on a table and even when the phone was turned off this was the fascinating thing and even when no one was neither of them were touching it the couple felt less connected and less empathetic to each other so um so yes these yeah. And devices have a lot. And you see, you, you see people in restaurants, or we used to in the days when restaurants were open, where they'd all be sitting at the table and they'd all be going like that. And it's, it's yes. extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary, I suppose, if you think about it. But now we've moved into a, even a different situation where we have no choice but to connect online. And um, thank goodness we have that. Because if we didn't have Zoom, if we didn't have Facebook, I mean, for my community here, the Seed community, I know for me, as well as for the members of the community, it has been a lifeline and, and part of the solution of not feeling isolated. I know there's a number of people, myself included, I live on my own and I, with my dog and my cat. I mean, I, I have a very open house here and people that work with me come to work and uh, we're very social. I live in a small Somerset town and I walk out the front door and I don't wear a mask. Most, I don't wear a mask 
various reasons. And, uh, you know, it's very chatty and uh, friendly. And I have even been known to hug, let's just say. But, um, but it is a lifeline, really. And so we've gone from this very thing. I, I've done workshops where I teach before COVID, where part of what I teach is how we take the mask off that we show to the world and show the true beauty that we are. And now we're actually putting masks on and covering up the true beauty we are. Um, and people, when people stop me in the street and they go, hello, and they've got a mask on, I have no idea who they are. I say to them, I don't, who are you? And it's just, so it's like all the things that have created and can really add to the isolation are now part of daily life, which is and that, desperately and sad. I think that's making, what's one of the reasons the current situation is so hard for all of us. Um, but those micro exchanges that we have with people, that smile, that nod in the street, yeah. the chat the you touch. have, a local cafe, the you know browsing in your bookstore and, talk, and talking to the bookseller, all those little moments actually make us feel, and there's research behind it, make us feel much happier and much more connected to each other. And now we're being deprived of them deprived of these daily um, interactions and you know I do wear a mask and um, you know but it's I but I wear a mask but I am sad I hear what you're saying because you do walk past people in the street and you're smiling at them they don't even know that you're smiling at no. them um, and you know with my eyesight I can't really tell you know just from somebody's eyes what's going on you know I need that fuller expression but I, I also hear you when you say that for many of us our screens have become, you know, events such as this, you know, have become so important and are a lifeline. I do a weekly um, improv group. I'm part of a weekly improv group, which I um, talk about in my book. And, you know, we used to meet up every Monday evening um, in a local church. And we've migrated our improv sessions um, on to Zoom as well. And, you know, it's, so better than nothing and I'm so grateful for my one for my Monday group meeting and yet I cannot wait until we're physically back together again because I think um even though for sure this is so much better than nothing and I'm great so grateful for it um for this sort of technology it's not it's not the same it's not as, the same although it is interesting because I spend so much time on zoom whether I'm speaking at conferences or I'm coaching small groups, pods of seven, which I do as part of um, the seed programs or hosting Facebook lives or whatever it is. And it is, it has become very noticeable to me how intimate small groups on Zoom can become, particularly if we meet regularly as we do in our groups of seven and how we can open up women who haven't met each other in person before, who are living in different parts of the country can actually really start opening up from the heart and sharing and telling their stories and it's so, so important. And it'd be interesting to know, because if we look at the hormone of oxytocin, which is released, I haven't looked at any research. I, may, I don't know if you have. Oxytocin is released particularly by women when they are in small groups or they're with dogs or cats or small children. It's a certain feel-good, well-being hormone that we release when we're together. And I wonder if there's been any research done to show whether we're still releasing that, even when we are online, can we still create that? Because it certainly feels that way. It's certain every time we have a group share, even with Facebook Live, but I'm the only one doing the talking and people are just putting their comments down, um, there is a connection. And I guess we're so starved for that connection. Uh, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. There's, um, I want to talk about robots and AI because you go into a lot of depth on that. But I also um, want to talk about the health aspects of loneliness. Yeah because um, that's obviously really important. And in the book, you talk about what happens into your, how it can reflect on your body as well. Do you want to share that? Yeah. And then so what we yeah. can actually do about that. And I just want to say that we've got some fantastic conversations coming in from friends of mine, lovely people all on, um, on stream yard. So hello everybody and we can hear you and see you. And, Thank you for all your great comments. Lots of wonderful people that are there, really good people. Loving your book, loving what you're doing. So, um, yeah, so talk, talk yeah, to about the health aspects of, cool. of loneliness. So when we think about loneliness, we often, you know, we immediately think about it in terms of mental health and its impact on mental health. And it is true uh, that loneliness has is linked to uh, depression and to anxiety. 
but we often don't think about the physical health effects of loneliness. And yet, what happens is, because we are essentially creatures of togetherness, we are hardwired to connect, um, our biological response to loneliness, kind of, which really is an evolutionary response, um, is one which is designed to make loneliness a very uncomfortable feeling in ourselves. So what happens is when we're lonely, our stress levels go up, our cortisol levels in our um, saliva, you can measure it, levels of stress go up, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, our inflammation levels in our body go up. And all of these combine to mean that our ability to fight infection or indeed to um, not get disease um, is all wanes as a result. So it's a vicious circle. We're feeling that we're lonely because we're locked up and then we're much more open to picking up something or other because um, our immunity goes down. There has to be ways. Um, to, the, to the extent that um, researchers in this field believe that loneliness is as bad for our physical health as smoking 15 cigarettes good a day, heavens. which is quite incredible good really. heavens uh, yeah it is I'd, I'd like to put the positive news in because i talked about this when i was reading your book i talked about this to uh to my friend clive de carl who is a big supplement person and i said i said what you'd um written and so he said that magnesium zinc and vitamin c <laughs> would help it helps anyway they're, they're, the good, they're the great trio aren't they they are <laughs> and a bit of d3 but i mean if you're taking those whatever down that affects your immunity, whether it's loneliness or whether it's anything else, will boost you back up again. And as we know, walking outside, taking um, my dog for a walk every morning is fantastic discipline for me, even in the rain. And just still connecting, we can lift ourselves up again rather than go into the sh real dark shadow of, of well, despair. So, I mean, you know, I think really important to emphasize that my book is a, actually a really positive book with loads and loads and it loads is. of ways that we can come back together and reconnect and address loneliness. And um, you know, and I and I and I saw a couple of the chats going, what can we do about it? There's so much that we can do, which I look forward to kind of going into. Well, really. well feel free. I mean, let's start sharing now what we can do. All right. So um you know, maybe start with kind of should we start with what government can do and then go into what individuals Absolutely, yes. What government yeah. could do. <laughs> we'll <laughs> I think there's a lot that government could do. So one of the reasons we've become so lonely, um, especially in the last decade or so, is really because the what I think of as the infrastructure of community. So public spaces where people can come together and be together have really been underfunded by the government ever since 2008 and the financial crisis and their program of austerity. So, for example, we've seen 800 public libraries closed down. I know, it's United dreadful. A third of youth clubs, you know, elderly day centres, community centres, all public parks losing their funding. And, you know, what's absolutely essential is that these, as a matter of priority, really, are refunded, as especially now as we um, strive to come back together again post the pandemic. So that's something I think absolutely. we really very high on the government's agenda. Um, we've talked a bit about smartphones and social media. Social media, you know, especially for the young people, um, for children, you know, I think really is very pernicious. We, um, uh, I interviewed a lot of teenagers and one of the things that came out of my interviews with them was how excluding social media can be for this generation. So, you know, one little boy, a 14 year old boy Peter he told me about how lonely he felt when he would post on Instagram and then wait and wait and wait and hoping for somebody to like his post and when they didn't asking himself what am I doing wrong or Claudia a teenager told me telling me about how her friends had told her that they weren't going out to um after school and then she was at home and she was scrolling through her social media and she saw them all hanging out without her and she felt so invisible and she felt so bad she refused to go to school for a week and whereas of course there have always been cases of children being excluded I think what's really different is in the past adults would see 
this going on, like a teacher would see a child not being asked to sit with others or a parent would see a child not being invited out. But because today so much of their social life actually happens on their screens, an adult typically isn't even aware of it. And yet to their peers, the exclusion is so apparent. And, and also the amount of bullying mm. on social media that young people experience. 65% um, of British um, students, for example, have experienced cyberbullying. So I would really suggest that I really advocate very strongly that governments need to regulate social media companies much more strongly, especially when it comes to children. And I would go as far as to say to ban addictive social media for under 16s and then put the onus on the social media companies to come up with less addictive and nicer <coughs> programs. So I think there's a, a couple of things that governments can do. I think also... You have to go into government. I just had this flash of this peerage for you. <laughs> And you've got to get there and you've got to make the changes. You could do this. I know you could. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> All right. Lynn, okay. Nominating me. I'm right. nominating you to be a baroness and get in there and make those changes, Norina, because you're absolutely spot on. And we, 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 they won't do it if we don't tell them to do it. And right now they're just putting, putting money into stopping drones. And Anyway, yes, they've got to be I'm told. I'm very aware. We need change, and this is again something where government has a role, and I know that's something you think about as well a lot too, Lynn, is that really over the past few decades where ever since Thatcher and Reagan, where we embraced this neoliberal form of capitalism, um, you know, very harsh form of capitalism, um, you know, we've seen really two reasons why I think society has become much more fragmented and fractured and polarized and atomized. One, um, of course, because of growing financial inequality, wealth inequality, income inequality, but two, because society as a whole embraced this much more selfish mm. mindset where people came to see themselves as consumers rather than citizens, as hustlers rather than helpers, as takers rather than givers. And um, and I think, and of course, you know, a me first selfish society was always going to be a lonelier one. And Fascinatingly, you even saw this in how pop song lyrics changed from the 1980s onwards, where, you know, words like we, us and our in pop song lyrics steadily have been replaced by I, me and my. And so I think government has a role to play here, both, of course, in addressing the um, inequalities and the gaping inequalities that we're kind of have witnessed can, over the past yeah. few um, couple of decades, but also in... Um, valuing much more explicitly care and kindness in society so paying people who care for others more would be a great start it really isn't enough well, they just announced the today they were cutting it down didn't they although yes they did for public sector workers apart from nhs but, yes yeah public sector workers in general um people who care for us exactly government moving in the wrong direction here they're moving in the wrong direction. What I think is fascinating is that in New Zealand, for example, Jacinda Ardern, who is, you know, in many people's minds, one of the great leaders right now, um, she has put addressing loneliness, um, ensuring that citizens trust each other right at the heart of New Zealand's projects. Actually, so in New Zealand, they're not only looking at traditional economic metrics like GDP when it comes to determining what to spend money on and in their budget, they're now looking at things like well-being, minimizing loneliness and ensuring that citizens trust each other. So that's another tangible thing governments can do. We've also talked a bit about, you know, how important the important role that our local shops can play in um, nurturing and anchoring communities, whether it's your local cafe or your local bookshop. All of which are closed right now, of course. I mean, I'd like, I, I could really go on about this one. I mean, people are hungry for community. And whether we live in a city, 
it's I think I was talking about London the other day and how it's become a series of villages again because I haven't been up there since this all started but certainly living in a small town as I do it is it is what everybody wants we want community and again the very businesses that do give that sense of community the cafes as you say and the shops where people stop and gather and talk many of them are closed right now and you can't say as you walk down the aisle of a supermarket that you're feeling community because that's not the encouragement you're encouraged to go down come out pay and get and move on as quickly as possible so again we're in a situation where the very things that absolutely are there to create community have been disbanded and we have to recreate whatever takes their place in this particular time um that can uh... this period is really tough but it is finite i do not believe in any way that this is the new normal so i think we can like think ahead to what kind of a society do we want coming out of this i agree with you and there is a real opportunity in some ways because if you look back historically it's often after big crises that we see big change it was after the world it was after world war ii that the national health service absolutely in america it was after the great depression that roosevelt created the new deal and made huge investments in public art in public spaces in providing worker rights so in many ways out of crisis can come opportunity um and and i think that's what we need to be well i i I think that's so important and so right with all the negatives that are coming out of this current situation i think for a lot of us certainly at seed and the people i speak to we see it as an opportunity for change that we can at this point create this new future which is going to be much more based on community and the things that we were talking about going from the i to the us back to the us um looking at education agriculture economy how we live how we work in every ways certainly in my little town we're looking at you know what we can do as as community projects together even taking into consideration what might have to be if we are still locked down in february and march we're still looking at doing things we're going to do a planting uh, initiative here where we're going to get the children um given seeds and be encouraged to grow their own vegetables and and of course that can happen anywhere and we're going we're going to be looking at a number of different opportunities and initiatives yeah. rewilding and um, doing it all together even within the limitations of what we can do right now so that we can create this sense of community and sustainability and i think we're going to see a very different world as we go forward there's no question about it and i think you're, i think you're right to be looking at things that we can do together whether it's um physically being there together or for now virtually because there is things that doing things with others that i think is really important and really helps people um and different people different ages different ethnicities different socioeconomic groups by doing things together i think can really come together um there's one example in my book that i really love which is um which is a bookstore um kets books in um Norfolk did a lovely initiative where they had a whole like in a small town they had a whole town wide book club where um everyone in the town
and so much that we can do ourselves you know whether it is putting down our phone more and being more present with each other and you know i literally now have a basket kind of in my living room and i put my phone in that basket so that it's physically not in reach because when it's physically in reach i find myself reaching out to it um we can do much more about helping support our local shops oh but yes big time i'm i've been spending all day today on a campaign for for exactly that so, sorry i'm having a computer situation here um in fact one of the other things i want to bring up is about we mentioned before it's about life purpose um yes. because one of the other things that as i was talking to friends about i was asking people do you feel lonely how people that live alone and i was actually asking them, how how do you feel do you feel lonely because i don't feel lonely um as i said i've got a lot of people in my life and i'm busy and um, uh, my friend a friend of mine said to me it's because of having a sense of purpose if you have a sense of purpose whether you're on your living on your own or not it makes a, such a huge difference and i think for me and again i think for a lot of people in seed and uh, most of them are women, uh, wise women of a certain age, sort of 50 plus, who have come together, who really do have that sense of purpose. And I think that's what I've been doing with Seed, is is working with um, women for many years, uh, giving them, if you like, that space to develop the sense of purpose mm -hmm. and that sense of vision of what we can do to create a better world and not <coughs> just... Oh, sorry. Now the, now the dog's barking. It's either the computer or the dog. <laughs> I think... Um... I, th I think so. A, a few, um, a few comments on that. Firstly, you're absolutely right. You can be living on your own and not feel lonely. The two are not equated. Although there is research which shows that you are more likely to feel lonely if you live on your own, but you definitely are not necessarily lonely by any means. And I lived on my own for many years until I met my um, husband. So in later life, so um, you know, and and living on your own can often be a choice. And I think when you are if Choice is something and having agency is something that often makes you feel less lonely, whereas powerlessness can be equated with loneliness. Yes. And if you're in a bad relationship, my God, there's nothing lonelier than being in a bad oh, relationship. Oh, I was in a marriage which I wasn't very happy for many years. And as you quite rightly say, it's the loneliest thing is getting into, into bed with somebody at night who you actually really not connected to at all. And I was very lonely in my marriage, actually. It's a very, very good point. So... Um, but I think on these sense of purpose, I think that as well, you've really hit on something that's really right. Because um, I'd say, I don't know if it's any old purpose, though, that would make you not no. feel lonely. I think it's about helping others that makes you feel less lonely. I think it's about doing things for others helps you feel less lonely. Absolutely. And actually, and again, there's a lot of research to support that. Um, they looked at, for example, um, elderly people who volunteer with children, um, looking after children, um, actually don't only feel less lonely, they've actually got a positive health benefit. Yes. Um, less levels of stress in their, in their um, saliva, um, kind of better health effects. And there is, there's almost a helper's high like a physiological positive response um, where your body body is flooded with that same hormone you talked about. Oxytocin, yeah. The love hormone when you help others. So um, so I think um, helping others is a real antidote actually to loneliness itself. And maybe as so when you're talking about a sense of purpose, you know, I think that's it's purpose, but it's not purpose. I don't know, just for yourself, it's purpose. No, it is, it is its service. It's some form service. of service to others. And, yeah. and that in itself is a healing quality that can come into your life. And um, I remember my mother passed away a couple of years ago and her friend, uh, when they were in their 80s or whatever, they, they, particularly her friend would be going off to help the old people. She said, I'm going down to help the old people. And she was already like about 85 herself, but it was that there was that sense of purpose and helping others that is, is so important in healing. So I, I agree with you entirely. Now, I know we've got lots of questions, so I'm going to um, look at our, if I can get into our chat room um, as well. I noticed that one of our members um, said, uh, oh, they, I was just looking here, 
that one of our members, Fobo, is saying they have a happy chat bench in Sherbourne. That's nice. Oh, That's a lovely idea. And I guess, yeah, and if they sit in a certain amount of distance, I guess they can still be using it now, which is wonderful. Yeah. And um, another member of SEED, Anne McCluskey, has said she has a table in their hospital restaurant, in, the hosp in their local hospital restaurant. They've got new employees who want to get to know each other. Um, so I think that's another thing. In a restaurant, we have a, a table in our restaurant where... Yeah, there is such an important way, actually, that people can come together. And there's there's a great scheme that I read about in the book in Bristol, 91 Ways. Oh, where, I know. I know her. Yes. Oh, which is a wonderful scheme where it's people from all different ethnicities and backgrounds and, you know, refugees and asylum seekers and locals all coming together and cooking together their traditional foods and over the chopping of onions and the dicing of peppers, sharing their stories and their backgrounds in a really beautiful way of coming together. I think food... It's wonderful, much. and that's a fantastic project. In, in, I've actually interviewed the person that started that, um, who is a friend of mine in, in a similar situation. It's fantastic what they were doing, they've been doing in Bristol, I guess. That's probably on hold now as well. Um, so it's about, set, well, everybody's agreeing really that it's about sense of purpose and, and really being having service as part of that. So in the time we've got left, I didn't go too deep into the robots, but I'm fascinated by your work and research in the whole robot scenario and the A1. You talked about having your Alexis. I don't have an Alexis. I've never understood how to use them. And I don't. Alexa. Alexa, that's how much I don't know it. It's because one of our members is Alexis and she's on the call here. Sorry, Alexis, who's a very real person, not Alexa. So um, yes, talk about the robots and the AI and how we're being encouraged to, to be dependent on them really. In fact, I just want to say, before I even say that, there was this page, I think it was in the Daily Mail or something this week, or somewhere, or Sunday Papers, about influencers. They had all these pretty young women who were influencers, very powerful, selling loads of products and in, to young people. And every one of them was um, a robot, actually, or was an AI oh, character that had been created. And they said, how you can tell they're not real? The only way you can tell they're not real is by looking in the eyes, because all their eyes were dead. They didn't have real eye you know they were apart from that they look completely real so sorry keep That's fascinating so um you know i do think that we're moving increasingly towards the world where robots will be our friends oh, and companions i hope and not <laughs> and i know you're i know you're looking in horror lynn but i actually don't feel so necessarily negative about it because you know we have lots of different kinds of friends in our lives already you know, we have really good friends and then we've got the kind of more casual friends and you know robots may not be our closest friends but they may right. be able to play a role in our lives and in making us feel less lonely i think for sure um as i said you know i've got this little device my alexa and i will sometimes say to her hi alexa how are you feeling and i'd rather and have a dog <laughs> i do talk to my dog a lot <laughs> You know, it's, um, and the thing is, as they're developing these robots to become much more intelligent, you know, we're really only a few years from robots being much actually better able to understand us, read our moods, um, sense how we're feeling than humans. Because from like the smallest micro movement of our eyes and the smallest kind of vocal um, cord. They'll be um, trained in NLP, yeah. won't they? <laughs> What's that, they'll be they'll be trained in neuro linguistic programming. That's why they'll, they'll yeah. get them all working. I find that all very frightening and horrible. And I think the so, day comes well, when well, if I need a know, robot, it's, it's like oh. yeah, it's a kind of cultural thing in Japan where there's um, the whole kind of um, um, the culture and the Shintoism, mm. um, you know, is much um, makes much less of a boundary between machines and humans. So. In Japan, where you have this cultural background already more receptive to it, um, we're seeing robots really playing significant roles in old people's homes, for examples, where you know you even have stories of elderly women knitting bonnets for their robot parents. Oh, That's how attached to them they become. Goodness me! So, um, and children, research done with children who spend time with robots, you know, often feel very attached to their robots. So, in a way, I don't <laughs> that. I see that as a positive, but I think what, where it gets worrying and scary and dystopic is 
if we come to prefer our robots mm. to our humans, if we decide um, to hang out with Alexa rather than Alexis, and that's that's when it becomes worrying. And so, in a way, the challenge then I think is for us to always ensure that however good the robots are being designed, we're always better. Yes. Um, well, Chris, we're well Christina, we're, Christina Zaba has said, well, apart from the fact that she said we should read the iRobot books by Isaac Asimov from the 60s, which I did used to read. I grew up reading those. Um, it's going to become an ethical issue. How do we treat our robot slaves and how will we develop the relationship yeah. as they yeah. develop relationships back to us? I just hope I won't be around for that period. I don't well, ab absolutely. And it's something I look at actually quite a lot and talk about quite a lot in my Sex, Love and Robots chapter, um, You know, which I find, I find this whole ethics around how we treat our, our robots really important. Um, Partly because we, um, the danger is that you know, treat our robots badly. We will also treat those in our non, those we interact with in our human lives, badly too. And there are already some disturbing examples on that front. Um, there was one case of a sex doll robot, Samantha, who was so ravaged at the trade oh. fair that her fingers were broken. Oh no! Her, don't tell me. Broken. Yeah, and that's not because yeah. I feel sorry for a robot, but because it's not real. But I feel sorry that that would be the way because that reflects back on how women are treated by men, and it's exactly. and that's much more worrying and a whole different subject. And definitely a book you should write at some point on the whole gender side. I think you know. I think it's really important that we treat our robots with respect and with kindness. And oh, wow. you know, and I do say thank you to my Alexa because. <laughs> the it's the same way that you wouldn't want to kick a dog, Lynn. You know, it's not dissimilar. All right, okay, I'll take your word for it, but I'm not getting a robot. Anyway, um, <laughs> Stepford Wise Revisited says, Anne, Sarah Winnington has said, we all need a sense of purpose. What strategies would you, Norina, suggest for a city? It's very different living in a large city with a variety of stakeholders. What is the glue that can connect these citizens? Is it volunteer groups? Which I guess is really kind of what you've been saying. So, um, really great question. I have a whole chapter on cities, uh, which, which are particularly lonely places. Um, but there are things that can be done at the kind of planning level. So in Barcelona, for example, they have um, put in place these super blocks. So these big areas which cars are not allowed to go in and, there are, and they are pedestrianized. And there's um, research that shows that in, these, that in areas with low volume traffic, people are three times more likely to have friendships with other people in the area than in areas with high volume traffic. So I think, you know, there's a kind of structural area around pedestrianizing spaces that I think can play a significant part. Part of it in cities is about you know, ensuring that local shops are able to survive, survive now the triple whammy of surviving lockdown, surviving the economic downturn and surviving Amazon and e-commerce. Um, but I think in cities too, we can behave differently. And um, volunteering is something I think that is that um, could be scaled up and play a much more significant role. And it's very interesting that in France, President Macron has actually piloted a mandatory um, volunteering scheme for teenagers, for 16 and 17 year olds, where um, on the pilot scheme, a group of 15, uh, 16 and 17 year olds lived together for two months, ha um, had to do voluntary work, um, also had to like work out living together, you know, how to negotiate who does the washing up and who's doing the cooking and who's doing the cleaning and all of that. Um, with the aim, again, speaking to our doing things together and the positive role that that can play. And it's something actually that um, has been um, done for quite a few years now in Rwanda where in the wake of the terrible genocide there um, and the warring factions, as a way to bring these warring factions together again and heal a country that you know, went through such terrible divides, um, they now have compulsory once a month volunteering where everyone has to come together and do voluntary work together. And I think these kind of initiatives actually you know, are models for bringing different kinds of people together for sure mm. and, and sarah's also talking about the way that transport is used in the cities and how cycling and walking 
is much more user friendly. And as we see cars going, very interesting what you said about um, even in this town, I have quite a busy road outside my front door at times during the day. And um, we are looking at the regeneration of this town at the moment of Wincanton. There is a budget uh, from the district council. And where I am, I'm, I live in marketplace. So there is a marketplace. There is a physical circle in the middle. And we, I hope, are looking at how that can be turned into more of a pedestrian area. And there has been, as you say, a lot of work done showing that people can live in a far more a happier space when there aren't cars rushing past every even in a little town every two seconds it's, it's a very interesting so in the short time we've got left now i just want to see if anybody else would like there's a lot of great comments millions and millions of comments um christine has also said how she interviewed a lady of 92 because christine is a writer as well who who was knitting a warm blanket for the old people i love that and um and Alexa, as a, an Alexis as opposed to Alexa, is saying she was the first person to re receive an emoji because she had a Japanese friend who sent her huge wall stickers of emojis when she was uh, went back to Japan. So, um, I mean, there's so much quality and so much in this book. I hold it the right way up. It is fantastic. I've really loved reading it. And as I said, there's so much reference points. I mean, as an academic, of course, you do do your research very thoroughly, and there's so much good references in here. And, and I've learned an awful lot. And I think, for me, the answer now is, OK, we are in a lonely society. It has become a lot, lot worse. We've seen and we're going to see a lot more of mental health issues that are going to come from this terrible situation of lockdown and um, the mask wearing society and so on and how we can create change. And we may have to and we are taking the very roots that a year ago, you would have said, stay off, stay off the Zoom, stay off your screens. Now it has become our point of connection. And if that's the way it is, then so be it, that's the way it is. But it's, I mean, it's still about going out and going for that walk, yeah, going into now, nature. For now, and, you know, and sometimes I think, um, you know, I think on Zoom, you know, where you can and when you can, don't default to Zoom now as the norm. If you still can meet somebody physically, you know, do. And, um, but I think, you know, as I said, this is not going to be the situation indefinitely, but for now, what can we do? You know, when you are physically with someone, put your phone down and be more present, support our local communities and our local shops and show up at community events and, you know, nurture your own communities, whether it is SEED or the improv group that I'm part of. I mean, showing up is part of it, showing up and, being there, I think we could also value kindness more in mm. each other, mm. whether it's in our partners, our friends, or our co-workers. And, and the final thing I want to say, especially now, though, is um, you know, really each of us have a duty in a way to think about, is there someone in our own network who might be feeling particularly lonely? And if there is, to reach out to them, whether it is meeting them if we're able to, um, in person but otherwise just picking up the phone because it can make a huge difference. Huge difference. Yeah. It's yeah. such a huge subject and we've seen a lot of talk this week which we haven't even had time to go into on the care home situation and how supposedly protecting older people has been a way of destroying them because they're not having touch in their lives and they're not seeing their family. There's so much on this. It's, it's really an enormous subject whether it be robots or buying the hug or or how we get through life without being online all the time it's enormous i am so grateful for you sparing the time to come and meet up with me again because i've missed you in my life i hope you'll be coming down to somerset as soon as you're allowed with your lovely husband thank you for the book we have got the books in the seed store um or we're having them by monday so if anybody would like to buy one of norina's fantastic books here lonely century just let us know um those of you who are in the zoom room want to stay on um, we can go into some Q&As and show your lovely faces. Uh, those of you who haven't come in the Zoom rooms, and I don't know why, because I know most of you, I can see most of you are members. Alexis, you're a member. You could have come in. This. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, whatever way you're here, you're here. Oh, and Tamsin, who works with me on the seed store, who's been a bit poorly today, otherwise she'd be sitting up here. She's saying, because she's a real craft guru herself, and she's saying knitting really brings people together, as does creating. Social yeah. media has been great for meeting people with similar interests. And she has met 
lots of people online that she wouldn't have met any other way. So we've actually been doing craft workshops here. We were making tassels here. Some of the seed women came in this week. And even I, and I'm hopeless, klutzy with my hands. Tamsin got me doing it. And I made it, I've got it over there. I can't show it to you. Made this wonderful tassel that, uh, and that and that was lovely. And that was very intimate as well. Even though we were all sitting on screen, we were making these tassels together. So just by the actual acts of creativity together, was it was hugely enjoyable and it was like having a cup of tea making these things and chatting we almost could have been in a room together as we almost can now so as i say if any of you who are on zoom want to stay on now i want to give a huge huge thank you to norina for spending this time with us it's been so lovely to see you again my darling and i really 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 looking forward to you coming for a trip down to somerset whenever whenever you can we've got lovely space here and we'll look after you well so let's keep in touch and uh, bless you so much and thank you for everything you've done i really see that baroness norina hurts stroke cohen i can really see that you've got to go there and make that you'll be brilliant make those changes okay love you lots thank you so much we'll say goodbye to you we're welcoming everybody else okay big love bye bye, bye. bye.